thank you, Michael. That was very interesting. A uh, great way to, to frame this discussion, raise some uh, topical and, and uh, thought-provoking points there. So to chew over those, um, to my uh, immediate left, we have uh, Danny Donado, who is founder and CEO of BipSync. And then to his left is uh, Jed Laskowitz, who is CEO of UInvest, JP Morgan uh, Asset Management and, um, and Wealth Management's uh, uh, newish business. And then to, uh, again, to his left, we um, have Judy Molinsky, who is president at Fidelity Institutional Asset Management. Um, we touched, or, or Michael touched on some of the areas he, he feels are really going to be big game chambers and, and, and cert certainly uh, stressed blockchain and uh, AI. But maybe if we could hear from the rest of you in terms of where you see the, the key technological, ch technological changes which are going to profoundly impact the, uh, the asset management industry. Um, Danny, maybe start with you. Sure. So my perspective as a vendor um, serving the investment front office, I think, What's interesting to me is before we talk about things like you know, data analytics, AI, um, you know, blockchain automation, I mean, we have to consider you have to get the, the building blocks in place, right? The way we think about it is getting the digital scaffolding so you can take advantage of all those technologies, right? So the blocking and the tackling, having you know, an automated way of capturing digital data, right? Not just content, but also activity that your team's doing, right? Do you have a normalized data store, right? Programmatic API access to be able to route information and data to different systems, right? All of these are the basics that you need to have in place. Um, and so I think that's, on our side, what we're seeing is definitely a push to get that, to get all the wires, so to speak, put in place. Great, thank you. Jed. Yeah, I might maybe take a different spin on the question, which is, you know, how do you organize yourself to take advantage of all of the things that the prior speakers and, and this panel is gonna talk about? And I think, you know, one of the ways we thought about it is, um, you have to really treat it as important as any of your other lines of lines of business. Um, and about two years ago, we created a group called Intelligent Digital Solutions that had you know, two parts. Um, one was the area where we built U Invest, which I think we'll we'll talk about, which we call you know, digital wealth management. Think you know fintech inside of J.P. Morgan and Chase, a cross line of business um, effort. Um, and the other side is a was a cross asset class uh, data science effort. Um, we had a lot of data scientists in the firm, um, a lot of work being done in, within investment teams and our trading desks. Um, you know using. Uh, you know, compute and, and, and AI to uh, assist in the research and trading process, but nothing really that was cross, you know, asset class. Um, and creating a team that was well-resourced with proximity to the leadership of the entire firm um, that had freedom to, you know, work and fail and, and, and iterate um, and was supported, you know, you know, financially was critical to getting all of, you know, those things, you know, those things done. Um, on the kind of practical side, you know, two areas, you know, where we've had a lot of, you know, focus in the space has been um, in areas of, of trading, um, uh, you know, NLP and um, uh, portfolio construction, and we can delve into some of that a little bit more. Great, thank you. Um, just to build on that, uh, we um, we wanted to take a perspective of well, what is the receptivity of all this? You know, you can decide as a firm what you choose to do internally, either to drive the efficiencies or the value add to try and create alpha. But we also wanted to see what is the likelihood that institutional clients or um, advisor clients or retail clients even want to embrace or participate. Um, through this interaction through applied uh, intelligence. So we conducted a survey uh, to 900 institutions ac around the globe to 25 different countries and over $25 trillion of asset management. And what was really interesting to us is that there was an expectation from this broad institutional marketplace that at least 75% percent said they were going to use AI as part of how they wanted to engage in asset management, either how they were going to do selection of managers, how they were going to think about asset allocation models. So that's a pretty important wake up call. So either you're doing it yourself as a potential asset manager, or you are actually being applied to by one of the institutions or advisors that may be working with you, certainly the larger ones. So I think that's an important wake up call for all of us, which is how are we gonna match up to that? So that becomes a foundation on how you really start to establish where are we going to begin? And certainly 
Uh, with Fidelity, we thought there's the front, how you engage with clients and institutions. There's the middle, which is both manufacturing, and then there's back office, which you know many have talked about. But you really have to have a strategy at each and every layer, not just one, one generic program. And, and do you have any examples within your businesses where you've started to look at blockchain or you've started to look at AI or maybe implemented uh, this into the business the, the way you're working at all? Any, any examples to share? If, bearing in mind that many of your competitors are here as well. So, but, uh. I'm happy to start. Um, uh, certainly, let's start with the front office um, and how we engage with clients. We took a really deep dive and started to look at blind spot monitoring, uh, anomaly detection. Um, we even have models where we're looking at propensity for redemption. And it's so accurate at this point that we can start to see within 30 days, we already know who might be redeeming and in what patterns. But we also look at the opportunity to say, well, if there's blind spots in how our individual sales teams and relationship managers are working, how do we help augment them to help them be um, less biased or not have a you know, a bias to um, maybe something that they, their own natural style of how they want to sell. But what we did is we turned that into what is the value to the absolute end client or end advisor or end institution. You have to really translate this back to not just internal efficiencies or profitability. I think the real hook here is can you transcend that back to a value to the end client? So it may mean less ineffective meetings, too many phone calls, you get better and better at how you engage with your marketplace, and that really, you'll see a noticeable difference. And we're at the point now where we have close to $100 million per month in lift that we can measure. Thank you. John. Probably two, two areas. One is uh, trading. Um, you know, we trade about you know, $1.3 trillion in equities and equity-linked securities um, every, you know, every year. Um, and if we look at our trading desk, you know, 10 years ago, it had roughly 50 traders and about 40 or so centralized technologists. Um, today, that trading desk has about 35, you know, traders, you know, six or seven, you know, quant, more, you know, data science type skills, and about 35 technologists that are actually, you know, sitting on the desk. Um, and as we you know, look at you know, what we've done to, to implement um, you know, machine learning into our trading process to help us you know, select counterparties that are most likely to give us the best price and fill the right you know, order, um, you know, we've you know, saved over a billion dollars in, in transaction costs you know, over, over the last you know, five, you know, five years. Um, so that's an area where we're heavily investing in, you know, in terms of, you know, these types of capabilities. Another one area which is, you know, quite inefficient for anyone that's ever been a municipal bond portfolio manager in the room is portfolio uh, construction in municipals. Um, you know, we, you know, built a, a muni bot that, you know, connects into a, you know, Bloomberg API that helps us, you know, source uh, bonds. Um, a process that would, you know, typically take, um, it's sometimes weeks to build portfolios. Um, we can get a portfolio in front of a, a manager now in, in, in basically minutes, so they can spend you know, much more time evaluating the, you know, the credits and the bonds as opposed to searching for the right, the right securities. Um, so those are you know, two areas that we're, that we're working in now. And then, then just more generally speaking, um, you know, one of the benefits of having a cross-asset class you know, team looking at some of these areas is being able to leverage capabilities across the organization. And NLP is one of those generalized capabilities where we had resources in a number of different product groups, but then extending that in a cross-asset class way um, where we could be looking at, you know, alternative data sources, proprietary data, you know, data sources, and um, trying to collaborate across in investment teams, which doesn't organically happen. I know that probably is not a surprise to many people in the room. Um, the equity people like the equity stuff. The domestic equity people like the domestic equity stuff. Um, so creating that collaboration on those types of tools, which will become more important in the future, um, is a really important way to build, build those things. Yeah. On our end, in terms of what we see interest in from, from clients, we like to think of the application of our technology in the research function as either the offense or the defense, right? On the offense, which I think we've talked a lot about is you know, productivity and or alpha generation, right? The defense side, I think it's interesting. It's compliance, cybersecurity. On the compliance side, some interesting um, trends that we're seeing is definitely an interest in trade surveillance and how you can incorporate 
additional signals into algorithms, right? So if you think of trade surveillance as working off of the OMS or the EMS, getting those actual trade histories, those transactions to flag the, uh, the, the activities to review, think about the data set that you can provide before that, right? What work was done on a name, right? Not just once the trade happens after the fact, right? But preempt that, right? So you can definitely augment those algorithms. So again, being able to have that digital layer to capture that information, to route it to the appropriate systems, I think um, on the defensive side is, is, is exciting for us and it's something that we're definitely seeing. Great, Michael, any, any yeah, thoughts I, I, I from just, your- I would just, just point out two things. I think is, um, I, you know, it's, it's, it goes without saying that the art of the possible, what you can do today is just you know, astronomically different mm -hmm. from what it was years ago. And I think also that to your point, Judy, the, um, the customer experience really matters. Like it genuinely matters for long-term growth, for differentiation, for engagement of the customer, either as an institutional <laughs> customer or as a retail customer. I mean, I think some of the things that you would point out in the industry, which are just absolutely insane, is why does it take 35 to 40 steps to onboard a normal customer? When the art of the possible is probably three or maybe five. I mean, there's no reason to ask for the same information twice. In today's world, years ago, absolutely, you had to ask for it many times even just to get it right. Today's world, it's all available to you. So. I'll give you an example of an Asian, uh, very a powerhouse institution. Some of the names were mentioned this, this morning. Um, we've worked with, with, with two Asian uh, uh, entities for a long period of time where today um, they're, they're using uh, social, in, social media and social engagement and GPS trackers on your phone, et cetera, et cetera. And all the same stuff exists here. And it's all coming here where today within the conversion rates have gone up so high that they can predict almost two plus weeks in advance of an actual purchase being made with some of these customers. Two plus weeks. Now, this is a public company, so you can see the public results in their revenue growth. And in their unsecured lending capability, which is a banking product, but they attach it to an asset management product, Unsecured lending has grown by 40x in this environment. For non-customers, they can give you a decision in less than five minutes. For a customer, they can give you a decision in less than a minute. That's a, that is the reality of that Asian environment, that Asian institution, and they're attaching asset management product directly to the back of a classic lending product, which, for all regards, is extremely boring product. It's awful but they dominate the marketplace because they invested in very smart technology. But they took it away from being a science experiment. That's the problem is there's far too much science experiment and far less I am going to change my business over this period of time in this way and everybody in this room is going to be part of that change. So the reality today of engaging with your customers in a completely different way is, is astronomical. I guarantee you everybody in this room is invested in Salesforce in some way. And I also guarantee that all of you are not driving it like a Ferrari. It's some form of a Volkswagen or a Lada or something like that. Why not? You can. People do. Learn from it. And get, make it a priority. You can't do everything. Pick one or two. But look at what other people are doing around the world and really understand that the art of the possible, it's already here. Chad, you wanted to? No, I was just going to add. I think that's absolutely right. <laughs> I spent three you know, years in, in in Hong Kong and was on the board of our China JV. And um, I, I know we have a lot of international experience on the the, 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 pa the panel here. And I do think a lot of those things are are incredible. I think the barrier to do a lot of those things here are quite different, but absolutely. but they rhyme and they're thematically the, the same. And, and and to us and and to me, I think that means. It's really about personalization Absolutely. and how quickly you can get to personalized experiences. I, I don't think that's just about self-directed with what we've done with UInvest. It's also about changing the way the advisor works um, and the information that advisors have about their clients. So instead of you know, sticky notes and, 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 and more manual processes, you know, th that is going to change dr dramatically with the available of data, both 
you know, internal and external and the tools we have to use to, to translate that information, you know, into, into some insight and deliver it directly to people if they choose to have it that way or have it delivered, you know, through, you know, through an advisor. And that's definitely not an either or. Too much of the b debate is about, you know, which one is going to win. They're both going to win. They're both going to be very big. Um, but I do think it's all about personal, personalization. And there's some fantastic companies that are, that are doing work in that, in that, in that space. Judy. Um, just to continue to give some discrete examples on this in this art of the um, possible is that I think because of the computing power that we now can enjoy and you can imagine it's going to continue to grow in this exponential uh, rise is that what might have been impossible because we just couldn't imagine how to actually grind through and develop the systems or capabilities. Now the power of that computing capability allows us to take such disparate pieces of data and bring them back together again. And uh, to use an example in Asia, I lived there for 13 years, um, you'd be walking up to Starbucks and you would already get the electronic coupon dropped down on your phone before you even got to the counter because the GPS data was merged with your buying pattern data, which was merged with everything else you're doing. So imagine that, the art of the possible, which is how are we going to do that and create this delight experience for whether retail or institutional clients and bring that to them. And this could be a combination of um, extraordinary creativity, and this is where humans come into play. So we, we keep hearing about how data and technology but humans are still the source of creativity, intuition, empathy, judgment. So don't be lost. <laughs> there is a role for all of you in all of this, but it's this creativity on how to put this back together again. And some of it could f come in the forms of um, visualization capabilities. You know, it's, there's things that are going to happen that we're going to experience um, wealth management or capabilities in ways that are 2D today. They're going to become 3D. So it's how do you create your organizational structures to allow that absolutely disruptive innovation, but you need the foundation, the stacks, um, the protocols to be ready to create the environment to allow that creativity to happen. But this is real radical transformation. But I think it's an exciting time mm. for the humans who are going to be working in these organizations to see a real new purpose. I, I mean, following on from these comments and, and picking up on a, a point made in the previous panel that perhaps the investment industry has been too risk averse when it comes to technology up to now. I mean, what's, what would be your response to, to that criticism? I think it's dependent on the firms and yeah. the pockets right. and the deep pockets. And I think some firms have been investing in it um, for, for decades. Um, this is not like a flash news. But I think it's a real serious point, which is because of this, it will really kind of sort out who's going to survive and who's not going to survive, um, which is not necessarily great for the, for the marketplace. Choice is great. Um, but I think it's going to really be dependent on how much prioritization is put into this. Um, organization by organization. Yeah. And I also think, just think it's about how you organize yourself as a, as a firm to mm -hmm. go after the opportunity, because it's not just about how much money you're, you're spending on it. Um, and it's also changing a little bit of the culture and the dialogue about where you start to solve a problem, you know, people versus trying to take maybe a little bit of a, a, a different you know, a, a, approach. Um, it, I, I heard you know, Cyrus ask the group how many data scientists are mm -hmm. in the room. Um, uh, that is also part of the challenge, but you don't have to be a data scientist to start to learn and understand and apply these principles. So one of the things that we have done is launch a you know, pretty robust training program across our asset and wealth management business. It kind of starts with sort of the sound cool at cocktail parties. That's literally what we called it. And it's like more definitional for terms and then moves into kind of keeping up with the kids, which is like introduction to Python and then more advanced training. So like taking time to change the dialogue and the culture inside your, your organization is an important step to starting to adopt these technologies. You know, our chief data scientist, Ravit Mandel, is on a panel later in the day, and one of the, I'm going to steal her line, so don't tell her. <laughs> um, one of the things she says, you know, we should be using these tools the same way we use Excel today. Um, and um, for that to happen, you've got to kind of start from the bottom and build those skills. And you don't have to be a data scientist in order to do that. Yeah. On the operational side, I'll take a very um, sort of tangible example. So the shift to cloud, I don't think there's a doubt 
that this industry lagged in that for a variety of reasons, but definitely in the last three, four years, you've seen a rapid acceleration of that. Call it three years ago, uh, probably at least 50 to 60% of conversations that we had involved some sort of on-prem question, right? Can you run you know, on-prem versus the cloud? We're not comfortable with that. Today, probably in the last 12 months, that equivalent kind of split, probably 5% or less, I can count on my hand, right? Um, we maintain the ability to run on metal, right? Just to, to say that we can do it. But honestly, I mean, we have zero clients that take advantage of that. So it's actually coming to a point where in the not too distant future, we may just discontinue that because it's an added cost for us to maintain that. And, you know, the comfort level's there. Mm, yeah. I think, I think we do see executive teams, you know, really thinking very carefully through what are the one, two, three priorities that they're going to engage in for the next three to five years that fundamentally either bend the cost curve or raise the revenue growth potential or change the fundamental customer experience and the brand differentiation that they have in the marketplace. So those three kind of sets of objectives as a portfolio of executive agenda items becomes the steel rod for the one of an example that are driving uh, clients forward uh, in our perspective. And what we see, for example, is, I mean, just take cloud. I mean, it's an amazing discussion, cloud. It's an amazing discussion. Venerable Boston asset manager, I won't mention the name, been around for a very long time, an amazing organization, publicly says, we're going 100% to the cloud. That would have never happened three years ago, and it absolutely would have never happened five years ago. But pick your horse. Is it AWS? Is it Microsoft? Is it X or Y? Pick your horse. Ride on the track. It's a good track. It will actually bend the cost curve. Mm. Take the bet. Take the executive agenda item and put it in place. I mean, that's where I think the, the reality uh, is today. Mm. And there's no doubt that for many, many years, um, and, and I'm saying this both as, as a prior executive in the industry and also as a consultant to the industry for a long time, um, you really didn't need to change. It's extremely healthy margins at the gross level, at the net level. Everything was hunky-dory until it wasn't hunky-dory. And it will not go back to hunky-dory. So what are you going to do? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And I think the call to action is clear. And the examples are unbelievably clear. You know, I just in my little notes here, I see an example that, um, you know, I think of some of these, you know, um, smaller fintech vendors are amazing. And, you know, there's lots of them. And I'm not endorsing them by any means. Don't get me wrong. But if I take, you know, what in the conversion process, how do you convert new clients? What firms like... Medallia is a bigger one, what, you know, what narrative science, what ProSensus, all these firms, what they're doing is amazing. But it's all done in small little science experiments. Mm. It's here and it's there, it's pockets of this, it's pockets of that. And eventually it will, by its own escape velocity, reach critical mass. But the question is, what is your agenda and how will you engage with it in a what critical mass format? Yeah. Um. I, I'm going to open up the, the, uh, to the floor for questions. So if you do have a uh, question, if you can raise your hand. And um, uh, there's a question at the front here. Excellent. And so there's a microphone on its way to you. If you can just introduce who you are and your question, that would be great. And anyone else with a question, if you raise your hand. That's great. Uh, Thank you. E e is it on? Yeah. OK, great. Uh, Peter Klein with Nationwide Insurance. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about the kind of leading edge of thinking around client experience when you're the manufacturer in the asset management space thinking about like retail intermediary distribution? Good question. Anyone like to um, take that up? I, maybe I'll take it from a consumer side and then, then someone can take it from a retail intermediary distribution. So one of the wake up calls f for me, because I spent 20 years more on the wholesale institutional side of the business and now being you know, really into the consumer is how much focus there is on research, consumer research, um, and on really truly understanding the end to end journey that the customer takes to become a, a, a client. Um, and I think you know, there are a lot of learnings when you build and design you know, digital products. And I think one of the advantages that some of the fintechs do have is they're starting from a clean slate um, and they are building a customer journey from um, scratch with, you know, modern, you know, tech technology. Um, our challenge is how do we create as fun and cool and, and, and um, impactful, you know, journeys, 
you know, on the, the stack that, that, that we have, which is, which is not you know, always easy. But I would say the research side of things before you go to launch something new or create something new um, is something that if I were kind of going back into the institutional wholesale, wholesale side, I would very much take back and have that be a much bigger part of the process um, in the way I think about and design uh, products. Great. I think that's very consistent if um, we, we talk about the advisor marketplace. Um, the buying journeys are changing. And in particular, advisors, many of them are trying to move up what we refer to as the value stack, where they're trying to move their practice into, do I spend more engagement hours with my in individual clients around whether it's tax, ma tax management or estate planning? And therefore, the process and the part about actual asset management they're either delegating or outsourcing, or they're wanting to work with asset managers in ways to make that a simplified buying journey. So can you help me with the planning, the selection of the individual building blocks, the asset allocation models, and so on? So that becomes a value proposition. And this goes back to earlier discussions, which is the more we bring AI and technology into that layer, and the way to move from idea to planning to buying to execution and simplify it and make that experience really fantastic, um, you're going to have to invest a lot of time and energy, but really understanding how to work with advisors because no two advisors are the same. We, we talk in generalities, but they're really, each one is different. And then they are working with their clients and each one of their clients is different. So the firms who can transcend and help them work with their clients and help that be an extraordinary buying, customized, engaged experience is really going to be an important part of differentiation. And that's going to require a lot of data, a lot of um, sentiment indicators, behavior indicators, and the ability to take it from end to end and not be 20 steps, make it a really elegant, simplified experience. And this is, this is a journey. Mm. But data and data architecture and AI is just phenomenal, and with cloud uh, tools to help enable that. Great. Thank you, yeah, Michael. Let me give you a very specific example. So um, you know, in, a, in a fantastic segment of the business, the ultra high net worth family office segment of the business at large, very lucrative ground for wealth managers, very lucrative ground for asset managers, mm -hmm. the experience really matters. And simplicity really matters. The fact is, by roughly 2030, which is not so long from now, 2035 maybe, uh, about 260 families will transfer about $2.7 trillion of assets. That's greater than the size of the GDP of India, just for reference. And the majority of that, let's not, let's not think about the, the millennials. The majority of that money is going to be transferred to women. How many times, just how many times, a raw benchmark, has your wealth manager met with the matriarch of the family alone? They don't, have an, they don't have an experience. They don't have a customer engagement even. That's staring them in the face. So then the question is, what can you do as a house, the value of the house as an asset manager, as a, a wealth manager in that proposition to give a better, richer, more meaningful customer engaged experience in a simple way to what is an actual transfer of wealth, which will absolutely take place. Because if death and taxes don't get you, that's what happens. Good stuff. We have um, a very short amount of time for any final comments uh, on that point or anything else to end on. I think I, we're, I think. I, I have one comment, which is everyone just has to find the time space within their corporations to start. Um, you know, one of the alarming statistics of our survey work was that only a third of American institutions actually have begun testing and using AI. But AI is not the same as digitization, which is an efficiency. You first have to have a real point of view what you want to accomplish with it. This is not just about cleaning up messy processes. Yeah. I think people confuse the two. So the key is to really spend the time and space in your organization to develop what's your culture plan, which Judge really clearly outlined, but also what's the stack, and begin 
um, in a way that has at least a single, uh, you know, a point of view versus treating it like an, just a pure efficiency gain. And I also just say quickly, we've mentioned millennials a couple times. This is not about millennials. Yeah. Yes. Like this is Absolutely. about ev ev everyone. Um, I'm, I'm not a millennial. I know you're surprised by that, but I like to think of myself as, as millennial minded. And um, the types of experiences and the research we do into the experiences that those customers want, it spans all ages. And we look at the trading activity, the investment activity, the behavioral activity, all of the data on what people are doing and not doing. It is so similar across age groups. Um, so, Excellent. Well, that's a very uh, interesting point to end on. Thank you very much. Can I ask you to show your appreciation in a normal way?